So I've called this talk Classifications of Psychopathology and Unifying Theory. Do we need a Darwinian paradigm shift in research methodology? Okay. This is based on a paper that came out last year in Psychopathology Review. Okay, so why Darwin? Let's let's start with Darwin. I think he's a good model of a scientist. And I think it's fair to say that what Darwin produced led to a seismic shift in science, commonly known as a, a paradigm shift, a radical change in scientific thinking. Before Darwin, um, creationism was, uh, was ruled and it was part of, of the scientific um, spectrum of, of explanations. There was an assumption uh, by many that the species, the animals and plants that we see here today, uh, were static and unchanging. Um, and most importantly, there was no plausible mechanism of change that was put forward that could really help the people that were seeing this sort of lineage and change, potential change in organisms, and explain it in a, in a properly uh, scientific and, and mechanistic manner. Um, then Darwin came along. Um, echoing also the ideas of Alfred Wallace, which I'll talk about later as well. And after this idea, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution through natural selection. People were, uh, um, after this period, changing their whole conception of how they studied biology. Um, so clearly it's informed our understanding of ecology and uh, and the, the development and evolution of, of the animals and plants around us. But actually also, Darwin's theory, the process of uh, blind variation and natural selection, has informed other areas as well. It's informed the way that we understand the immune system, the way we understand learning in terms of uh, genetic uh, algorithms in learning and computer programming. And also, if you think about what this understanding gives us, this this solid way of appreciating the um, long period of evolution and our um, kind of collective ownership of the planet with other animals and plants, I would argue that's pushed forward issues like animal welfare, human rights, sustainable development as well. So I think if we're going to model on somebody, why not model on Darwin? Now the reason I've chosen Darwin is because Darwin was faced with a similar dilemma to the one that we are in the mental health sphere. He had a classification system that had been well worked up uh, for animals and plants um, that described the properties that distinguished all these different species. <coughs> and so are we. Now, why should we be applying something so remote from mental health into a mental health sphere? I think it's fair to say that even though we've, there have been all kinds of initiatives within the mental health sphere, there has only been moderate advance in the, in the preponderance of mental health problems. I think it's fair to say that there are huge inefficiencies in the current system in terms of DNA appointments, waiting lists, unmet need that exist. And I could be doing this talk on the transdiagnostic approach. I'll touch <coughs> upon that. But I think it's fair to say, and I was talking with Ed about this earlier, the evidence that the processes that maintain uh, mental health problems are transdiagnostic, shared across disorders, is actually kind of overwhelming, really. But that has not been translated into everyday practice or in uh, guidelines and recommendations. And, and what is the reason for this? So, the think tank question is, can Darwin's biological approach to the, to the Linnaean classification system inform our psychological approach to the mental health classification system? Okay. Now, to, to make this analogy, you're going to have to draw two particular um, light, uh, kind of um, analogies across this. One is that you see a diagnostic uh, category in a mental health system as analogous to a species. Okay? And the second thing is you've got to think on a different time scale. So what I'm going to argue is, is I'm going to look at change within a lifetime and draw analogies between that and change over thousands of generations. Okay? So you need to get yourself in that kind of mindset to draw these analogies. So to summarise what Darwin's scientific approach was, and in particular how he dealt with the classification system, he showed that actually different species share features. Okay? 
So this is an example of different species of, of finch. They all share beaks, okay? And actually some of them share very similar um, beak structures to others. Um, so even though maybe the combination of certain features might make a species distinct, there were certain elements that were shared. And this shared aspect across species was continuous across the species. And you can see this really neatly in that, in that diagram there, how the, how the size and shape of beaks vary on a continuum, not in a very categorical manner. And that's important because he was looking at this smooth process of change. He found that there was important individual variation within a species. So even though different species are different from one another, within a species, the individuals are all different. That's vital to evolution because it depends on this natural variation within uh, the same species. He also pointed out that these um, aspects that were, were, that were classifying animals and plants were not mere ornaments. They were functional uh, parts of their, of their um, anatomy, for example. Um, so the beak that was you know, one of the things that might categorise uh, an animal, the colour of its plumage, etc., they could be ticked off to, diet, to uh, put it into a certain species category, but they've all got a functional purpose. The beak's there to crack seeds of a certain type. Okay? It's there for a purpose. Now, sometimes these, these purposeful parts of the animal might, be, um, might have lost their use, like our appendix, for example. And sometimes these aspects of the animal might both be an advantage, like the long tail of a peacock, but a disadvantage because it attracts parasites, okay? <coughs> so there's sometimes it's something is both functional and dysfunctional, okay? But in all cases, it's something that has a purpose rather than mere, being mere ornament, which is a phrase that he used. Um, Darwin also pointed to the fact that species do actually change over generations, and he pointed to the fossil record and the geological record for this. And then he made the most preposterous thing he came up with a theory that explains change in all life. This wasn't a theory just of, you know, barnacles that he was interested in. This wasn't just a theory of animals. This was a theory of all life. So he produced this unifying theory that explains change in every single living organism on this planet. Pretty ambitious theory. And not only that, but this theory wasn't just a set of ideas. It had a specific logical structure. It was algorithmic, mechanistic, and could be quantified. And therefore, since Darwin has allowed people to make models of evolutionary processes and ecological change. Okay? So it, was, it could be mathematically modelled. And that was Darwin. Okay? Now, where should we go faced with our mental health classification system? And what evidence do we have to draw parallels with how Darwin approached his? And I'm going to cover some slides on this evidence in a moment, but I'll summarise them here. Different mental disorders share symptoms. Symptoms vary in degree and intensity across disorders, just as these uh, properties of living organisms vary across species. There is important individual variation between people with the same diagnosis. Symptoms, so-called symptoms, are not mere ornament, which is often the way it's treated in medicine. They each have a purpose, even though sometimes that may be sometimes functional, sometimes dysfunctional. We'll cover those. Diagnosis changes over time. Recovery happens. Change occurs. <coughs> so, if this is the case, how would we draw a theory out that's analogous to what Darwin did? We'd, we would be preposterous as well. We'd come up with a unifying theory of change across all mental health problems in this, di in this diagnostic system. And the theory would have to be very precise, very mechanistic and quantitative and allow us to do modelling and testing. Okay? Let's just cover some of this evidence, for which I think, you know, I've just taken bits and bobs of evidence. I think the evidence is quite strong. If you look at studies that have looked at this, and I don't mean that looked at them, you find, for example, that the, that the diagnostic symptoms of one category are nearly always elevated in various other categories. Post-traumatic stress disorder system, symptoms in personality disorders and in bipolar disorder, we've, we've done work on that. Uh, elevated rates of depression, anxiety, in all kinds of other disorders, psychosis, eating disorders, substance abuse. 
even though rate, elevated rates of psychotic symptoms in people diagnosed for anxiety and depression. Um, so what we, we don't find that psychiatric symptoms are specific to a diagnostic category. They occur across the different categories. Okay. And they're measured, if we measure them on a continuum, we see elevations along that continuum in people with a different diagnosis. We also know that there's huge individual variation within a category. Some of this is revealed by the nature of the diagnostic systems, and Richard Bentall points to the fact that because of the nature of the diagnosis of schizophrenia, you can have two people who reach the diagnosis of schizophrenia without any overlapping symptoms between one another. It's called a disjunctive category. Some other people have looked at this particularly and tried to look at all the different kinds of combination of symptoms there could be given a diagnostic criteria. Uh, apparently, for PTSD, it's 175 different combinations. <coughs> for conduct disorder, it's over 30,000 different combinations that people could potentially have. And if we're actually looking at evidence, self-reported <coughs> evidence of symptoms, even within a specific episode, such as mania, you find that across many different studies that we reviewed here, there are about seven different factors of different symptoms, only one of which is the kind of euphoric mood. There's paranoia, anxiety, panic, activation, etc., etc. So this huge variation, both within individuals and even within a, a single um, kind of episodic experience. So we've got some mileage there as well. We also know that diagnosis change over time. This is often the rule rather than the exception in childhood, as uh, I'm sure if you have any colleagues who are child psychiatrists will, will tell you. Um, but also when we look at adults, we see changes in diagnosis over time. And of course, we see recovery over time as well. So there is change. So we need to want, and we really want to explain this change process. That's the most important thing to check, to explain, because we want people, and we hope they want, to move to a position where they're less troubled by their problems and, and reach recovery. So we need a theory that explains that change process. Um, again, what might we might mark off as symptoms. I, th I would suggest there are some very clear-cut cases where these are functional processes that have a dysfunctional aspect to them. There are attempts often to try and cope by the person that or to actually keep the problem going. So worry defines GAD. G uh, worry is an attempt to problem-solve, to distract, to seek safety, but it ma maintains the stress. <coughs> we have behavioural avoidance and phobias, neutralising thoughts and OCD. I would suggest that lots of these things that we call symptoms are actually part of the process of how a person is trying to cope with their problem. And just like within the evolutionary domain, you see this conflict, this two-sided element of any kind of process, that it's often something that's attempting to be to maintain well-being, but actually undermines it. Analogous to the way that certain aspects of animals and plants attempt to promote its survival and reproduction, <coughs> but actually undermine it in other ways. And these are called evolutionary trade-offs. Uh, to the extent there's even a concept called evolutionary suicide, where an organism can, the whole species can become wiped out because of the selection of a property that is useful in one context, but actually life-threatening in others. So the analogies are, I think, are, are pretty close. So here we come to the um, more ambitious part of this, which is, if this is the case, where do we go from here? I would say we therefore need a theory that is like the theory of natural selection. Mechanistic, dynamic, algorithmic. You can build testable working models with it. <coughs> Completely unified. It's about change. Now, some of you may have some other ideas about what that theory could be. Um, I've only really found one of these, um, and it's a theory called perceptual control theory. And I'm going to really spell out the analogy with evolution and what that informs us. Now, perceptual control theory has been going on, it's developed during the 1950s, and it uh, was developed by a control systems engineer, and it's based on the notion of negative feedback control. And I'm going to explain this to you. Okay? Very soon you'll see why this is the link point between Darwin and mental health. Okay. In um, engineering... Negative feedback control is an essential component of many um, functional machines and systems, um, including production lines and the steam engine. 
This is called the Watts Governor, which employs negative feedback control on the steam engine. Without it, there will be no way to keep the, uh, the rate of the engine going at a, at a, a stable uh, level. And so it will be very erratic when you were getting, how you are getting your steam output coming through this in a way you would not be able to control um, the steam, fat, steam run factory or steam engine effectively. What happens is as the steam comes through, these little balls rotate faster. Okay? The faster they rotate, because of the centrifugal force, they rise as they're rotating. Okay, so the faster the steam comes through, the, the, the higher they raise. As they raise, they tip a lever which closes the inlet from the um, uh, of steam coming into the machine. Okay, so if you can imagine, the faster it goes, actually that makes it cl the, the lid close. The slower it goes, that makes the, the lid open. So what it reaches is a stable state which is determined by the weight of those balls. And you can, you can control the uh, rate through, through that process. This is negative feedback control in its most kind of raw form. Okay? As I say, there would be no industrial revolution without this system. Where else do we see control? We see control in something called homeostasis, which you're all doing right now, and if you weren't, you'd be dead. You're keeping your body temperature in a, in a, a level. It allows you to survive. You're keeping all kinds of chemicals in your blood at, at the appropriate levels, including your blood sugar levels, for example. But also, um, behaviorally, you're controlling aspects as well. If you weren't controlling your posture now, you'd all be slumped on the floor and you wouldn't be able to actually sit up and listen to this lecture. You're controlling your eye fixation. Okay, The posture is actually constantly being tweaked and adjusted by pairs of antagonistic muscles in your body, and in, in the example of your head, there are antag antagonistic muscles that keep in your head upright. Without it, without their continual activation, you'd just be slumped on the floor. Okay? So you're controlling now, and the interesting thing is you're controlling and you don't even know you're doing it. Control proceeds most of the time automatically and unconsciously. Okay? So perceptual control theory is like a psychological form of homeostasis, of negative feedback. Except rather than physiological variables being controlled, sensory inputs are being controlled via the environment, via your effects of your behaviour on the environment. Okay? So it's just, the brain is doing the same thing, it's just, it's just controlling its inputs. But the, the loop is going out through your behaviour to the environment and back again through your senses, rather than going through your bloodstream and back into your brainstem. Okay? But it's homeostasis, essentially. This theory was related to um, earlier related theories uh, in the field of cybernetics. But when you, when you read more on this, you find that Bill Powers was much more specific and precise. And particularly, he made this clear statement that behavior is the control of perception. Effective control is the control of input, not the control of output. And this is how it works. The idea is this is the, this is the functional unit. You can use this to model any kind of process that's being controlled. But in practice, you've got uh, hierarchies and parallel elements of these units that are controlling multiple things all the time, just as you are controlling multiple things all the time. Um, I'm not going to go through this in, in enormous detail, but note that there's something called a reference <coughs> signal, which is your goal state. You compare your perceptual signal, which is your input coming into your senses, with that reference point, and the error, the difference between those, drives your output signal, which then is converted into your action in the environment. Your action in the environment needs to get transformed by something called a feedback function, which is kind of how your environment allows you to affect change, and then you take that input through into your senses. But this is not a serial step-by-step -step process. This loop is running continuously and simultaneously and in parallel all the time, okay? So it's not the standard stimulus response uh, view because the, the, the locus of control, if you like, is coming internally within the organism, within those reference signals. Okay. Now, this is, the, this is I think, the, the, the quote that I was very pleased to find. This is a quote from 
Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace, when they wrote a paper together to underline their shared theory of evolution by natural selection. The action of this principle, evolution, is exactly like that of the centrifugal governor of the steam engine, which checks and corrects any irregularities before they become evident. And in like manner, no balance deficiency in the animal kingdom can ever reach any conspicuous magnitude because it would make itself felt at the very first step by rendering existence difficult and extinction almost soon to follow. Okay? So there is Darwin making a direct conceptual link between negative feedback control and evolution by natural selection. <coughs> this is a uh, diagram that I put in the, the paper to, to spell this out and that, because there's another thing, and I don't know if many of you will have done biology, what you, what you um, learn in biology is the distinction between a genotype and a phenotype. The genotype <laughs> is in your genes, the phenotype is how you express the coding of those genes in your, in your environment. And a key principle, and this goes right down to, you know, for example, Dawkins' work on genetics, you only inherit your genotype, you do not inherit your phenotype, you do not inherit acquired characteristics. Okay? Your acquired characteristics affect your survival, and, um, and affect how much you're going to pass on your genotype, but the genotype is what gets passed on in your genes. Okay? You see exactly the same thing during the lifetime of an animal and a human regarding the relationship between control systems and behaviour. So take as an analogy, genotype and phenotype is analogous to control systems and behaviour. When you have a control system, your, ner your nervous system is geared up for some particular skill or act or goal, you engage in that goal in the environment using your behaviour. But according to this theory, which is totally analogous to natural selection, you do not pass on your behaviour. Your behaviour does not continue to the next iteration, the next time step. It is not learnt. Okay? What is learnt, what you pass on, is your adjustment in your control system. The gains, the delays, the tweaks and the balances in how you want to control things and what you want to control. <coughs> your actual behaviour is, is not predetermined. It arises through a spontaneous and dynamic interaction between you and the world and other people. Okay? So, where does this lead us in terms of research methodology? This is a, I think this is a fabulous quote by Bill Powers. And it's, it's, it's long, but I think I need to quote it all. I used to have a Martin house. Sam Martins and House Martins, in my backyard. Those birds often wouldn't bother to use the perch. They'd fly up to their hole, fold their wings, and pop in without touching the sides. Consider the precision of control that's needed to do that from the infinitely variable set of starting positions and trajectories. How accurately do you think the aerodynamic forces of the wings had to be adjusted to make a 20-foot approach curve on a breezy day go within a quarter of an inch of the centre of the hole? I never saw a bird miss a try. If you did a scatter plot of disturbances, these the winds and, the, and, and what have you, versus compensatory forces and the muscles, it would have been a straight line. Organisms are constantly producing this kind of precise control of consequences of acting. If the correlations were as low as 0.8, we'd be finding dead bodies all over the place. They'd be crashing into the side of the holes. God knows what the real correlations would be like, strings of nines. 999. The problem with conventional approaches to behaviour is that scientists look at examples of exquisitely precise control going on all around them and they don't see anything happening. A conventional study of Martins entering their Martin households would probably ignore the control process being demonstrated hundreds of times per day and would search for some relationship between, say, number of hole entries per hour and proximity of human dwellings. They'd be doing group statistics on something that actually is about the precise workings of the individual. So, therefore, what should we be doing? If we're interested in unified theory and this very precise working models, we should be studying universal processes, not diagnostic-specific ones. We should be asking what perceptual variables people are controlling and how are they controlling them. We should be studying the individual and not groups. And ideally, we should be building working functional models to prototype against real-world data and look for those 0.99 correlations. Now, obviously, this is a tall ask, and it's only a piece of research program that I'm only part of the 
the way through and starting. So I think it's, it's acceptable to have some intermediate ways of approaching that. So I'm going to share with you some of the work we've done and, and some of the work we, we hope to do. And hopefully it will see there's another way of doing things. A very simple way of looking at um, processes across disorders just to recruit a heterogeneous group of people. So we've done that uh, in student populations, in primary care services, and by focusing on a particular type of recovery, like using art, but not choosing specific diagnostic problems. And um, from a qualitative point of view, this gives you, because you're listening to the client telling you from their perspective, from their perception what's going on, hopefully you're going to get to the bottom of what the core elements are. And we find consistently that people talk about this loss of control, this sort of rock bottom moment when they realise they needed to seek help and then the process of recovery being about take, uh, regaining control. There's other elements in all of those studies, but I just wanted to focus on that one. What we want to do next is form, develop our own form of qualitative interviewing that really tests for the control variable, that really tries to work out the different things, the different experiences people are trying to have, the different things they're trying to control for in their everyday life, so that we can change the kind of the standard method in someone that's much more refined and assumes that people have these experiences that they're controlling in an ongoing way. Another way of looking at, uh, at this and going universal is again to recruit widely diverse diagnostic groups. This is a study of over 300 patients in Perth with various different anxiety <coughs> disorders and depression and we gave them all different kinds of measures of psychological processes and subjected that to factor analysis, we found a single factor solution despite putting all these different processes into the, uh, into the equation. This single factor accounted for, mo to the, mo for more of the variance than the others. It correlated with anxiety and depression independently, um, both across and within the different diagnostic groupings. And we just, just because we were interested, we also extracted the next five factors, even though they didn't fall out of our... Um, our scree plot, and none of those actually correlate with the symptoms. So if you, if you take a universal approach, you can often find a universal factor. And, and you know, I can talk later about what that process actually is from a control theory point of view. But I want to share a few more studies with you first. This is a study we're in the second round of submission with. Um, so we'll just go to the third. We are, in this example, honing in on a, on a diagnosis-specific problem, spidophobia, but we're going to set up a, uh, a paradigm that is not the traditional stimulus response, presenting something and then looking at reaction time or delay. We're going to create a, an, a, an, a virtual environment in which someone can exert control continuously over a continuously variable um, experience. In this case, distance from uh, an image of a spider on the screen. Okay? And we are not going to instruct people, we're not going to even tell them this is exposure therapy, we're not going to instruct them to expose themselves to this. We're going to see what the role of the client's own control is in this process. And from a control theory point of view, clients need to be in control, and all the change that happens is a me method of regaining control. So we would predict that if you have more control over the uh, distance you are from this image, that would be more effective in terms of the, the exposure therapy, as opposed to a condition where this, this image is coming at you in a way that you're less able to control. Um, and this is what we found. We found that in a behavioural approach task, one, when people who'd had high control over the distance of this image did the exposure task, they then went closer to the real spider um, after having done the task, whereas those who didn't have control over it actually went further away from the spider. Okay? And even two weeks later, it had an Im a differential impact on avoidance in everyday life, where the people that hadn't been granted control actually increasing slightly in their avoidance of spiders in everyday life. Um, and we've looked at this in our, in our therapy called Method Levels, where we've looked at moments. If we've got people to look at videos of their therapy and look every two minutes whether they have control over the therapy session. And we find that this correlates closely with how helpful they find the therapy in that two-minute snapshot of the therapy session. So control is good, but control most of the time proceeds automatically and you don't know it. 
Control is not about straining to do something. That is when you're aware of controlling, and the reason you're aware of it is because you're in conflict, which we'll come back to. Okay. I've also used that same paradigm to show this point I showed earlier, that, that there are no learned behaviours, <coughs> that avoidance is not a learned behaviour. What avoidance is, is it's, a, it's an internal preference for how close you'd like to be to, to the thing that is in your environment. And you'll use whatever behaviour you need to do to achieve that homeostatic, that stable distance that uh, doesn't trouble you. Um, so we predicted that no matter how you change the, the means of acting in the task, people with spider phobia, as you see in this black, black graph at the end, will always hold that spider image further away from themselves. Okay? And we, we messed around with this. We first showed that this was the case even with the spiders moving of its own accord. Then we showed that this is the case whether you need to push the joystick away from you to get the uh, spider away, or you need to pull it towards you to get the spider away. You still get the same effect on distance, irrespective of doing the opposite behaviour. And then we just really mixed it up, and every trial you had to learn to work, you had to work out whether you had to do it, move the joystick left or right to get the image further, and people still had that consistency, uh, even though they had to do a different behaviour every 10 seconds. So there are no learned behaviours. Um, so, if we're not going to change people's behaviour, what we're going to do? We're going to help them control things in their lives better that they want to control. And these are the, and I'm not going to go into these in detail, but these are the kind of things we're doing. So we've got therapy, which is all about helping people to control stuff more in their lives. The therapist gets out of the picture, really. He's constantly prompting and noticing things for the client, but not telling them what to do. Just helping shift and sustain their awareness to the elements of their life they want to control uh, over time, helping them to balance those out better for themselves. Um, and we've got uh, an NIHR fellowship at the moment, applying MOL in first episode psychosis, and we're doing research studies in schools and prisons with meta levels too. Uh, Susan McCormack's gone to work with people on death row to help them come to terms with um, the, 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 um, the extreme and understandable issues that they go to using meta levels. Um, and we've got a PhD study in a school, a secondary school at the moment looking at it. We used what we call the Take Control course. This is a six session group um, intervention in which people can come along, there's no need for self disclosure, they can come along for as many or as few sessions as they want um, and they learn about and talk about and, and think about control and how they balance control over different things in their lives, how conflict comes in, in the way and how they need to hold things in awareness to, to develop uh, and solve problems. We've got good uptake that, of that primary care. We've shown that it's non-inferior to one-to-one -one therapy in, in a low-intensity IAPT service. And we've even got a grant going in to, to help stroke sufferers uh, using this approach. Um, and we're also moving uh, and looking at dementia. Again, another key area where interpersonal control is so important. And changing your way of being and talking to help the person with dementia have some control is key. And so we're doing research, interviewing people with dementia and asking them what's helpful about, what the helpful elements of conversation. And we think that it's going to be certain aspects that grant them control and don't over-assume things uh, for them. Um, there's a, an intervention called Empowered Conversation, which um, six degrees, the... Uh, Social enterprise that we work with on meta levels is, is using to train carers of people with dementia to help them talk with people in a way that facilitates uh, their, their control much more clearly. So what's the future directions based on this approach and what I would be very excited if any of you wanted to do. <coughs> what we haven't done yet is done a prospective studies that look at the mediating role of this core transdiagnostic process. I think we've gone, done enough studies to know that it exists. We, we're not quite so clear on exactly what it is, although I could talk to you theoretically what I think it is. And there's no studies yet looking at how that might um, affect uh, change over time. Uh, but we've put in an MRC submission for that, so we'll see. We need to be doing more research, and this is a really tough bit, 
building and testing functional models of things that people do, of elements that are interested in. Um, maybe everyday behaviour, emotion regulation, interpersonal control, you know, things like social distance, etc., etc. A proper test of this theory is going to be actually whether we can build models to emulate these processes within the individual um, as, they're, as they're going along. There's been a lot of work on this in simple performance tasks like tracking cursors and tracking shapes of objects. Um, but theoretically, this could be applied to anything that person's controlling in a, in a situation. Um, as I say, I want to advance the questioning style for qualitative methods to, to, to really systematically look at what people control. The real challenge for the future is the fact I've only explained, explained to you the, the building block of this theory. This building block comes together in hierarchies. Those hierarchies conflict with each other, and that conflict needs to be resolved through a process called reorganisation. The, 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 this network can also operate in different modes. All of this stuff is harder to test, but is quite important to understanding how therapy works and how mental health problems work. So that's a challenge for the future. Um, and I touched upon this with Ed earlier. We also, I think people out there who use a diagnostic system want us to explain why psychological disorders present differently if they're being maintained by the same core process. Um, this is a diagram which I think represents where we're at on this. Um, we would say that there's a, if you look on the left here, this shared process, this is the core process that we're talking about. We would say that the more that we identify this process, the more likely someone's going to tip over the relatively arbitrary cutoff point, which is a, a we judge as it being clinically significant, um, which is marked by the dotted line on there. So there's our core process going on on the y axis. On the x axis, you've got all the different problems that a person might have. Below that line, Below the dotted line, these are all problems that all of us have, and we emphasise and we're preoccupied with to various different degrees compared to each other. Cleanliness, creativity, safety from attack, supernatural, building a safe home, using alcohol. They're just these are just the concerns that we all have, and we're all different in those regards. Okay. What I would what we would propose is that the reason why you get diagnostic categories that seem different is because it's essentially an artefact of the individual variation in the general population in people's different concerns. It's just that in the people above that dotted line, those concerns are the manifestation of this core process that's driving their problems. Whereas below the dotted line, those people are, are managing, like the rest of us, enough that it doesn't reach a, a rock bottom, a, a tipping point where they've lost control. So if we were going to test this in, in our research study, we'd have to do some pretty big studies looking at these kind of concerns in the general population and, and testing whether they are the same and whether they do map onto the different diagnostic categories and whether the key judgment as to whether someone's got a diagnosis or not is the existence or the degree of this core process rather than which particular area of concern matters to them. Okay. So that's everything.